So much of our pain is based on assumptions. And then if we were able to really live a life that questions more and is more curious, rather than assuming, the benefit of that would be not just that we'd be wiser and know more, but more importantly, we'd have less pain and more joy. Welcome to Autumn. Every time you say Autumn, think about that Barney song, which probably most people don't know. Sing it. You can call. I don't remember. I remember watching. I don't it. think Autumn was in it. It was. You can call it fall, but I'll call it autumn. Something like it's that. It's so not at all how I <laughs> Oh, you know the song? I, j- just enough to know that you butchered it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Barney's we're back not, from I don't summer. Think Barney's not around anymore. No, and there's a reason for that. I'm not going to go into it. Some kind of scandal. Uh, which often, yeah, I'm going to get into trouble here. I'm not even going to go yeah. down that road. Yes. So, welcome to the Spiritually Hungry Podcast. We're back in full swing. I'm already exhausted in <laughs> September. Uh, but let's do it. Yes. So today we're going to talk about questions versus assumptions. And I hope it's not a spoiler alert because you already look confused, but assumptions are kind of bad. You said questions? Asking questions versus making assumptions. I like what you say. You say curiosity, right? Uh, that's something, that's why I never share with you where I'm going to go with this because like, that's like, hello. Did I just ruin the whole podcast? That's not a lead. That's. <laughs> That's where we're leading to. I'm sorry. Apologize. Gosh, can't take you anywhere. That's li- literally why I don't tell you anything beforehand. So basically, because I listen. <laughs> no, because you the, you then just take the one thing and you just throw it out there. Like, okay, yeah, you said it. Now what? <laughs> <laughs> so we make a lot of assumptions every day. Like I would assume that you would keep that to yourself. Michael, what's hmm. one assumption that you've made about me today? One assumption I made about you. Hmm. I try not to make any assumptions. I should always be curious about you. Yeah, <laughs> so not right. <laughs> an assumption. Oh, an assumption. I made an assumption that you'd be late for the beginning of this podcast. I don't think it's assumption. I think that's pretty much based on uh... <laughs> reality. It's still an <laughs> assumption. It hasn't come. In, didn't come into reality when I thought about it. True. I guess if you keep uh, assuming that, I will continue to be late. <laughs> Oh, it's my fault. <laughs> you are the creator. That's of the it. point of this podcast. <laughs> it's your fault if you assume things about others and it comes true. So here's the danger of making assumptions. Assumptions set us up for disappointment. Were you disappointed when I was late? Not at all. <laughs> I expected it. <laughs> That's the good side of assumptions. It protects you from being disappointed. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. You, yes, not most. When we're making decisions based on information that we only assume is still valid, people evolve and change. Their plans change. Store hours change. Things change. So when you assume things to be a certain way because they've always been that way or they were that way even two weeks ago, yeah, and you, you will get into trouble. You'll be making mistakes. Oh, well, right. I remember we actually had something like that happen to us last week. What was it? We went out to dinner with somebody and they wanted oh. to eat outside. Exactly. And we assumed totally because they that restaurant always, always had outside seating, and the weather's still nice here. Yeah, but and then they got them. there before us because you made us late, <laughs> and boom, we had to go look for another restaurant. Exactly, so that's such a good dangerous. example. Exactly. When we've communicated our thoughts, feelings, and needs one time, we assume that we don't need to bring them up ever again, and that usually is not the case. I would say even worse than that. Usually, we assume people didn't even know our needs, and if they're not fulfilling them, it's because. Them. They don't want to. Or they're not, so they're not they a good partner. Assumptions easily become expectations. And we all know how it feels when our expectations aren't met. So this is, what it, this is part of what the danger of assumptions are. The one simple way to avoid disappointment and all that assuming is ask questions. Be curious. Ask questions when you don't understand. And ask questions even when you think you do understand. Right? So it's not even just like, oh, I need clarification. I think it's even more important when you think you know to always be open to the idea and the possibility that you don't know. Right. So here's a challenge. That, for, yeah, so it's a famous. Walt, I believe it's a famous Walt Whitman quote. Do you remember? Be it? curious, not judgmental. Mm. Here's a challenge for our listeners to gauge how often in their day to day they're making assumptions. Next time you make a choice or think about what you're doing this evening, ask yourself: Am I basing any of my choices or plans on previous experiences? 
Am I 100% sure that everything I think I know is still relevant? And it's really hard to keep those two things at the forefront of your mind as you go through your day. And also, I mean, I, I would say that, of course, you have to live with assumptions. Of course you do. The question is, what are the assumptions that are causing you pain or disappointment? Like you and wake the, up in the morning. The I wake up in the morning. I, I set my clock. I have I have I have my morning connection, my prayer. So I have that. So I set my clock, my alarm clock, knowing what the traffic is usually like, and so I'll get on time. That won't always be true, but that's the assumption I have to make. So some many assumptions that we make are very healthy and necessary. You have to live with assumptions. I think what we're talking about here is. Well, the, did you know the UN was here this week? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that must have changed your traffic. Actually, it didn't in the morning. I have to say, whatever. because I'm leaving it. Sure. Whatever it is. Okay. Uh, okay. But my point, my point is clearly, there are times it's we live. You have to live life making assumptions. I think what we're talking about here are assumptions that can cause disappointment. More importantly, judgment about others, because you can't live life without making assumptions. Yes, Impossible. and there's a there's a reason our brain does that. Actually, which I'm going to get into a little bit in a little bit, but. Why don't we ask more questions? Because a lot of people don't approach life right, I like think that. If you think about it, kids constantly ask questions because they're curious about everything, and they have no um, embarrassment, no shame about asking a ton of questions because they're in that learning mode. As we get older, we get embarrassed about asking questions. Is that think, what it is? Yeah, I think ego plays a big part of it. Maybe. I, I, I think. I, I, let me finish my yes, thought. We yes. think we should know certain things. I assumed I knew what you were going to say. Uh huh. Sure. I assumed you were going to interrupt me. <laughs> <laughs> And it depends what crowd you're in, right? You want to see maybe be like the smartest person in the room. I think as we get older, unless you you purposely decide to live a curious life and to ask questions, and you know, through asking many questions throughout your life, we are forever a student. The more you ask, the more you'll know, right? But but most people don't necessarily go through life that way. Right. I, I think that one of the reasons people make assumptions is yes from ego but because we think we know it's not that we're embarrassed if i ask questions i'll look like i don't know everything i think it's both but i think more often than not it probably is the fact that i know i know that this person who did this to me is a bad person or this person who's behaving in this way is a you know is an idiot and so on and so forth i think I really think it's both. I really because I'll tell you why. There, I really respect that quality in people. Which when they are curious and they'll ask any question, even if like let's say I've been, even if it seems a little bit obvious, but and I've been witness to that by asking by them asking a question, even though I knew the answer, I learned something I didn't know. Right? There's always a deeper understanding, and not everybody will put themselves in that position. I think our daughter Miriam's really good at that asking questions, asking questions, and then she'll research, and then she'll come back and follow up with the conversation. Like, not everybody has that quality. Um, something I really liked about my father, he used to do that a lot. When he didn't know something, he would always say, is that right? Like, and I always, I always noticed that, because I've seen people through my lifetime of just trying to mask it. Like, yeah, I knew that. Um, so I think, I, I think we're, I agree with what you're saying, but I, I think this is another reason as well. Yeah, you know, we're not curious because we're afraid. Yeah, I, I don't disagree, but I do. I do see very often that people assume and don't ask because they think they know. Yeah, and that's for sure yeah. ego, and that really I see that in relationships a lot. So this is to the brain. I just want to say something before before we go forward. Is that I think, like you said, you touched upon. You said relationships. I think so much of, as a matter of fact, if we have time, we we'll go even a little bit deeper on the spiritual understanding of this, but. So much of our pain is based on assumptions. And then if we were able to really live a life that questions more and is more curious, rather than assuming, the benefit of that would be not just that we'd be wiser and know more, but more importantly, we'd have less pain and more joy. Well, as you were speaking, I thought about this. I've heard people say, well, I assumed you wanted me to do this. Fine, next time I just won't, I won't try. I won't do it. I don't know how to win with you. I see this with relationships a lot. And that's like a cop out because a person, of course, wants you to give, but they also want you to hear them and ask questions about how they want to receive, right? That whole assumption, I assume this. Well, don't assume. If you really want to put yourself, especially in relationships, in the place of giving and offering or having that connection with somebody, ask questions. How would you like to receive love from me? Really, what is, and we gave a podcast a few weeks ago about your love languages, but I, I mean, I, 
all the time. Like, well, I, I keep to rejected me and I'm hearing the other person saying, but I didn't want that. I want this. So like, but I'm not going to give you that because you can't receive what I'm already giving you. I assume, you know, and, and on and on. So and that's an important point. I, I don't want to gloss over it, that assumptions is viewing the world and assuming that everybody and everything is like me. I don't know when you realize this, but for most, like the first part of my life, I really believed that everybody was just like me. Oh. I believed that, you know, what was funny was funny. And just to, to, you know, and I believe that if, if somebody was pursuing, let's say a spiritual pursuit, it was for the same reasons I was, and they were really pure of heart. And I really like years later, I was like, whoa, that was, why did I even think that? Why would I even assume that? Even if somebody, let's say, right, you go to the same gym every day, or let's say you work at the same company that's a startup and really like green, right? We assume that because somebody has found that place that you like and you really feel part of, you belong, you assume they're there for the reasons that you are when you have absolutely no idea at all. Yeah, it's interesting. No, I, I think I realized very early on because I saw myself as very different than everybody else. So I just assumed everybody else was very different from me. From me. So I think that's where I think I naturally came to curiosity in that way. Well, that's interesting. I also thought everybody was different than I was, but then I was, I didn't accept it just as that. I was like, well, I need to find out why. And, and I asked that question for years, do I need to change to belong or, and finally, obviously, no, different, being different is great. In fact, I'm going to plug it. Our children's book, Abigail and I, The Gift of Being Different, is coming out October 18th. You can pre-order now on Amazon. Just had to say that. Um, it's a so, great book, but the point if is... If I can say to all of our listeners, please pause the podcast right now. <laughs> go on to Amazon, pre-order the book, and then come I like back and that. listen to the podcast. I like that thought by immediate action. But I didn't accept the difference as automatic that I was, you know, so everybody else is also different. I didn't connect that till years later. And I think that... Um, by the way, when I finally came to that, I, I, the only regret I had is why I wasn't kinder to myself and my thinking. Because I used to think like, you know, if we're all similar and this thing isn't working, then I need to change or I need to fix it. And I put tremendous pressure on myself. And that freedom of, of knowing that you never know what somebody's thinking, even if they appear to doing exactly what you're doing day to day, don't assume. Don't assume it's the same. So I want to talk about the brain for a second. So another reason we stop asking questions is that our brains need to save energy. And I love studying the brain and how it works. Um, I appreciate that part of my body more and more every day. But our brains make assumptions because they're an efficient way to process the world and our brains favor efficiency overall. The faster our brains can process information and signal us on what to do next, the better for our brain, but not so much for us. A Yale neurobiology professor, Dr. David McCormick, explained the brain's vast neural network requires huge, huge amounts of energy to keep it running. I mean, just think about it. I mean, we never take the time to think about how our brains really work. We just assume that it will work as it always does and be able to put things together and have thoughts and, and depth and do what you always did. So he says there's over 100 billion cells in our brain, and each of them makes over 10,000 connections with other brain cells. While the large number of possible combinations of cell connections allow for higher ordered thinking, this is a big problem evolutionarily in terms of energy cost. Therefore, the brain has to encode things efficiently to save energy. So I want to unpack that for a second. One way our brain saves energy is by making assumptions. We draw on our past experiences to find patterns or mental models of how the world works. When we encounter new situations, we apply these patterns or assumptions to the new environment. So for example, I can assume that last week, you know, what I wore to work last week, I can wear to work next week. I mean, usually it's just sweatpants. <laughs> um, and I don't take into consideration anything's changed, right? And, and I think that's safe to say, and if you live in California, the weather's always say you don't anticipate anything else. So we make these assumptions so we have time to use all of our other brain cells for really important decisions. Of course. Coaches Jack Colwell and Chip Huth from Arbinger Institute point out, assumptions start causing problems when we believe our way of interpreting a given situation is the only way to interpret the situation. And I think I really wanna hit on that because assumptions aren't bad, we need them to some extent. But when we think it's the only way, of course it's going to get us in trouble and of course it's going to be isolating to those around and us. And I do, again, this is a little bit off topic, but I also wanna point out 
that you know there's that book by uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, right? That idea of of thinking from the gut, right? The sort of the, and that well, the gut is really the first brain. It's the real brain. right. But he, but he, but the idea being that people who have many many years of of, of practice, their assumptions are very right more often than not because and it's important that they that they use their assumptions in that way again just to the point that assumptions Mm, which book did you read because i'm reading one of his now talking to strangers and he talked about how even people who are professionals when it comes to people who are lying you can't necessarily tell i don't know if that's a blanket statement of assumptions you can't always not always of course not always statistically i'm saying that that Sorry, it's not Malcolm Gladwell, it's uh, Daniel Kahneman. Yeah, it thinking wasn't Malcolm, because fa- thi- he wrote a thinking, book that's saying <laughs> that's against thinking, that. Thinking fast, fast and slow. slow. That, there are, that there are two uh, uh, brain, ways that the brain thinks. And that, and that, again, professionals, doctors, they're, after many, many years of experience, they're, they don't even know why they're making that decision or coming to that conclusion, but they're often very right. All to say that I, that clearly, clearly, Making assumptions is a very important, necessary part of life. What I think what we, what we want to stay away from are the assumptions, certainly about other people, well, that they, leads to judgment, and assumptions that keep us from learning new things. Exactly, because when, and I think I think the point you just made is so important. When you think that that is the only way, right? Then you the, think other people's opinions are less than yours, which then of course leads to judgment. Right. Can you remember a time when you were operating under the assumption you were right about something and found yourself labeling, well, you're just too spiritual for these questions, but I'm sure you're human. So you found yourself labeling someone else as wrong only to discover your assumption was not right or wrong, just limited in your perspective. Yeah, I I I think one one of the areas that I have tried and continue to try to develop is this idea when, when you have a disagreement with somebody, and even if you're right, even if you think you're right, no, no, even if you're How absolutely you know right. You, well, no, there's, there's, times, there's times you're right, there's times true. you're wrong. Okay. There are times you're absolutely right. Well, but, you're talking about an argument we had, but yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I'm never right. <laughs> no. Uh, but, but even when you're right, the view that you then make of the other person, which is that they're bad or they're stupid for thinking the other way, How could they is be? wrong. And, and I think this is, and this is again another key point. We're never as right as we think we are, and the person who's wrong is never as wrong as we think they are. And I think that humility helps mitigate the ego of assumptions. Again, so I can have, and I've had in my life, many disagreements with people where I've been wrong. I've had many disagreements with people where I've been right. But it still would be a great mistake for me to think that in those arguments, disagreements, that I was right, that I was 100% right, they were 100% wrong. All we're talking about is percentages. I maybe was 80% right, they were 20% right, but it's never, and therefore, and the reason they did it, it's funny, I was thinking about somebody today, who I've had, in my life, I had many disagreements with them, but I can always say that they were coming from a good place. They might have done, in my opinion, and maybe objectively not the right decision in one or two situations. But their the place from which they came, and the reason they were making those decisions was a positive one. So all that is to say that the danger even of being right in our assumptions is the ego will then let us think, oh, you're 100% right, and that person is 100% wrong. That is never the case. It's only a matter of degrees. I'm 80% right, 60% right, and so on. And be open to... Another. Be open to being wrong, and be open to, to definitely be open to the other person's view. And that's why I often say this, when, when you're having an, an argument with somebody, or an important disagreement, if you can't see, really see their side, you can't really be sure about your side. Well, let's unpack that a little bit, because that's really interesting. Right, so, so you know, it's, and I think relationships is probably a, a clear way to, to, to see this. You've seen more than I, but we've seen relationships where one person thinks, these 10 things about their partner. And they think that their partner is 100% wrong in these 10 situations, and they are 100% right. That is almost never, ever, never, it's never ever, the case. Ever. Right? It's just a matter of degrees. So maybe in this case, 
I was more right than wrong, and she, he or she was more wrong than right. But the black and whiteness of it is what damages the most. Because if I understand that the reason why you did this was not because you hate me and you only want to do bad for me, but you had a different view of it and you were coming from a different place and maybe it was still not the right thing, but it was a whole different um, decision process, then there's much more to work with. There's much more middle ground. We're closer than if, as often we say, you're, you're, you're this, you're one, two, three, you're these terrible things, and I'm all these pure things, and you're, right, so what, what is it, what, what middle ground can there be? But I also feel like it's just not a way, it's not a way to be happy. Like, if you, if you really want to derive the most joy from your experiences, whether it's your day-to-day, or just feeling good about yourself because you're learning and you're growing, or because you are successful in your relationship, and that doesn't mean you don't fight and you don't disagree, but that you're that openness, that that ability to say, "This feels really right to me. I think I'm right, but I'm always open to that." There's a part I can't see. You just can't. It's not even about right or wrong. It's just Absolutely. an openness. And I think that the people that I have come across, and even just from our lives, it's that openness and and going away from the assumptions. Sure, assume that the weather and fall is going to be roughly the same for the most part. You might get an off storm here or there. You understand, you know what to accept. You can assume you know what to wear, whatever, right? Assume that you go to your favorite coffee place and you're going to get the coffee you like every day. You can make certain assumptions. Assume your children will always love you unless you really (laughs) destroy that. But the day-to-day, you know, where I'm changing, you're changing, everything's changing, assume nothing's going to be the same. And therefore, you need to ask questions and you need to constantly try to go deeper in your experience of the things that come up. Right. And I think where the rubber meets the road Oh, is, I like that. You never use that, that little really? phrase. It's kind of it, very um, older generation. <laughs> <laughs> um, is in the interpersonal relationships. That's I think that's where assumptions may cause the most damage and the most pain. And by the way, it's not just the close relationships. So you know, you can use the example of the person. I actually was watching something today on social media where somebody was said that was talking about somebody who he did not know had dumped some garbage on at the end of his uh, driveway. I saw that too. And he was like saying really negative things about that per, about that that person's a terror, whatever. He called them names and so on. And the point is. He doesn't know who that is, right? So he doesn't really know that they're a terrible person. You know, it happens to us all the time. You're 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 at the airport, and the guy, the person, man or woman behind the counter is behaving is not being helpful, right? So the assumption is this person is just you know a bad person, or or somebody doesn't know how to do their job, right? It might be that they just got a terrible, you know, news from their from their spouse or their child. Who knows what's going on in their lives? And and when you think in that way. It doesn't make their behavior right, but it alleviates even some of your anger about it. I love what you're saying. It reminds me of something David Foster Wallace wrote about assumptions um, and really leading to benefit of the doubt. But he says, he gives an example of um, somebody who goes into a bank and meets with a bank teller. And you're sitting there, you spend time driving there, you have important things in your mind to discuss, and the bank teller seems really distracted. And they're not really paying attention. They keep asking you every other word that you said, and you're getting angry. You're thinking, why doesn't this person think I'm important? Going on and on about your needs, your desires, your necessity for whatever it is you had to get done that day. Like, it's all about you, because that's the lens in which we look, right? And then the bank teller just can't sit there anymore. She excuses herself, goes away. The manager comes out and apologizes and said, I'm so sorry, that, that she was so distracted, she just found out that her husband and child got in a car accident and they're being rushed to a hospital. Oh. Now, and, and I, I love that example because in truth, that's life, right? We never ever know what is somebody's past, what their worries are, what their trauma is, or what they experienced right now in that day. And then you happen across them, maybe you need something from them. And the assumption is, 
They don't think I'm important. They don't really love their job. They're miserable people. And you go to that place and it's really not about that at all. And that's really the danger of assumptions, whether it's in your deepest, most connected relationships or if it's strangers on the street. There's something called false consensus effect or consensus bias, which we touched upon a bit, which is basically we think everybody thinks like us, right? There's even a name for this because everybody does it. And in fact, we have no idea what resides in another person's heart or mind, as we just gave the example with the bank teller. And I think also many of our assumptions are learned behavior. Like if you grew up in a home that thought money was hard to come by or that love was hard to come by, then you would assume perhaps, unless you had a lot of moxie, that life will dish out the same thing for you, right? We base a lot of our assumptions on how we were raised in the home, what we saw when we were growing up. There's an interesting quote from Carl Jung that really I think is another idea that's important for us to work through our assumptions and be more curious. He says that everything that irritates us about others can lead us to an understanding of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Which is a Kabbalistic principle. A very Kabbalistic principle, that there are no coincidences. Every person that I see, be they the best person, the worst person, doing the best thing, doing the worst thing. If it awakens something in you. It's only there to awaken something within me. So that... So even if you see somebody and you're like, wow, they're amazing, and maybe you feel a little less than or a little jealous, you see somebody else, you're like, oh, that is disgusting and despicable. Whatever it is, the fact that you're noticing it and you're having a reaction or an emotion to it means that you need to see it and you need to come to why that is. Absolutely. So let's talk about the people that annoy us and the the things that upset us. Because that's where we put most of our time and energy. And most of our assumptions and most of our judgment. The only right reaction to somebody who upsets you, the only right reaction to seeing somebody behave badly, is to stop and ask, what is it that they're doing that I can learn about myself? Now, it doesn't mean that if I see, you know, somebody's, you know, slapping their kid, that I have to worry about being aggressive in that way towards my kids, but it does well, mean... you can learn what not to do in that situation. Well, I'm hoping many of our well, listeners don't have, don't have that, that issue, but there is something in the way I'm treating my, maybe my children or somebody else in my life that is not with kindness. There's still an aspect of that energy. Exactly. And if you really live life in this way, and this is, a, you know, the Baal Shem Tov, the great Kabbalist, who's actually... His birthday. His birthday Virgo, today. Virgo, Virgo power. I was always so excited when I found <laughs> another Kabbalist besides me that was a Virgo, because we get a bad rap sometimes for being a little bit... Well, I always say, right, spiritual... Touchy on 1%. Um, <laughs> well, exactly. That non, non-spiritual Virgos are not great, but spiritual Virgos are awesome. the best. So, and he, he taught this, that people would come to him all the time, and he was a teacher to many, and they would come and say, you know, I see the, my neighbor doing this, or I, and they would always say, the only reason the Creator is showing you this is because something that you need to change by seeing that. And if you go through life with that consciousness, and it makes you more curious, not even so much about them and why they're doing it, but more importantly, what am I doing? Or what do I need to learn? Why, why is the Creator showing me this? Because it's not by coincidence. And it's not to teach them or to judge them, or to assume anything about their lives. It's only so that I can go more deeply into myself and it's discover something new. Too. I think sometimes people feel like they need to save them, or it's all this like, I love this idea. It's just be simple about it. If you're seeing it, you're seeing it because that aspect is is in you. And there's a famous even the positive, right? You have the potential positive. Yeah. To so go the positive, I, I I think maybe more importantly the negative. The negative, I know. Right. There's a Kabbalistic phrase that says that a person almost never sees their own faults. We sometimes see big ones. We sometimes see small ones. But the reality is that our nature, our ego nature will almost never truthfully see our flaws. And therefore, we're given the world. We're given the world not to judge it, not to assume it, but to use them as a mirror. Maybe not the exact thing, but in that realm that I need to change. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's so important, really, to live life in this way. Now, again, this isn't easy. This is not easy. It, it, it is more, certainly easier, more natural, more ego uh, a focus to look outside and say, this person does this bad, and that person does that bad, and I just saw this person do. Remind yourself, and this is a very important tool, very difficult to put into, into action, into practice. 
tomorrow, today, next time you see somebody behaving badly, stop and remind yourself, the only reason I'm seeing that is because there's something about that behavior that is true within me. And unless you discover that, you're missing a great opportunity, because that's the only reason it was shown. You have to accept that it's very difficult for me to see what I need to change about myself. And these are gifts that are coming to me all the time, these gifts of mirroring something within me in that realm. And the only way to accomplish that, to discover it, is by being curious, not assuming that I'm anything about them, but learning what it is about their behavior that I need to change within me. Don't you find uh, that it's, I think when people are uncomfortable with something they see, whether it's somebody else's success or somebody else's disgust, instead of doing what you're suggesting, we push it away by judging it, saying, I, I don't want that, or that's so far removed from me, or how can anybody be so vain, or whatever it is, because it's so uncomfortable to see truth. It's so uncomfortable to see a mirror, right? right. right. And I think that next time you have that emotion, any of our listeners, or you have that that kind of moment where you have this awareness, pause and say, okay, I'm so uncomfortable, but I really do need to identify where that lives within me. Absolutely. And I'll, maybe we'll just end, which I thought was a beautiful quote from the Dalai Lama around this topic. And he says that love is the absence of judgment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really beautiful because we don't really think of love in that way. And I know, again, we know too many people who live in judgment and think that they can live in love at the same time. Mm -mm. And those two are really mutually they exclusive. They cannot coexist. Yes. So I'd like to share a the, letter, yeah. a letter yeah. from one of our listeners. And again, a reminder to all of our listeners, make sure to keep sending your questions, comments, letters, stories to Monica and Michael at Kabbalah.com. We read them, we are inspired by them, and we also share them with the rest of our listeners, and you have the opportunity to inspire them as well. Hi, Michael and Monica. This is my second email to you. I love, love, love your show. I share it with all of my friends and my family, especially my young adult children, who I hope listen to your wisdom. Mm -hmm. Today I experienced a very challenging emotional state, and I left work early to nurture myself with self-care, to navigate the difficult predicament I now find myself in. Awareness around my own self-care has really taken on a new level for me, particularly this year. To start shifting my mood, I focus on what I could do to support myself. Firstly, I released emotions by allowing myself to cry. Once that passed, I visited the store to buy some healthy food for dinner, ran a few errands, and spoke to some close friends. These seemingly teeny tiny little decisions really helped me. To move my mood further, I decided to go for a beach sidewalk, and I popped in my headphones to listen to episode 107. Episode 107 was speaking to me like something from beyond. The timing was impeccable, and I spent the time smiling and nodding in agreement saying in my mind, oh yes, I do that, and oh yes, I could do that. As I walked and listened, I felt so blessed to have found your podcast and the opportunities that it has provided to my soul to grow and develop. You both made a difficult afternoon much more enjoyable. Bless you both, Amanda. That's beautiful. So first of all, thank you, Amanda, for sharing the story with ourselves and with all of our listeners. It makes us so happy. This really what what inspires us to continue with this podcast. These these type of stories that knowing wherever it doesn't even say here where you live, wherever you live, somewhere in the world, somebody was walking on the beach and their lives was made just a little bit better by this podcast. So thank you, Amanda, for sharing it. I hope this story and email inspires the rest of our listeners not only to listen and put into practice the podcast, but also to share it with your friends and family and share your stories, questions, and comments with us at Monica and Michael at Kabbalah.com. As always, we hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as we enjoyed recording it. Stay spiritually hungry. <laughs>